you know that saying that, oh, if you're a business owner, you have the freedom of, for your own hours. It's true, but let's put that in context, right? Having the flexibility of setting your own hours doesn't mean you don't have to put in 10 hours a day. It doesn't mean that you don't work seven days a week. Welcome to another installment of the Perspective Podcast. This is my uh, co-host, Mitch Harley. My name is Devin. And today we're going to be asking the very important question, are you your own worst enemy? And if you are, how do you get out of your own way? And I'm going to start it with this. If a business um, is made up essentially of of three main parts, uh, you know, people that you're serving, the thing that you're serving them with, and then a way to continue to grow and operate that business. And we touched on this in the last podcast um, and just before we started here, you mentioned proper allocations of funds. And that's the thing that I'm leaning into. So if you have a really well-oiled machine, let's say you got people that are coming in on a consistent basis and you got the people to do the work and fill that, you know, for the fulfillment of that, but you're missing that third element and because you, 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 or you're, you're noticing that you're not being able to grow your business or there's no opportunity for growth. That's that third thing. And if without that third thing, um, a plateau is inevitable. But what happens after a plateau? There's usually a nice fall into, you know, the abyss of of businesses. And now you're back in that kind of uh, creating a job for yourself rather than, um, you know, the financial freedom and time freedom that comes along with, you know, operating a business properly. And, you know, it's funny you talk about the plateau and kind of going down because a lot of people goals have to be successive, right? Like you have to have a short-term goal. You have to have a a mid and a long-term goal. These are things you have to put in in place. So if you don't have that long-term goal or a path to get there, then when you hit that plateau, the reason you go down is because you're not going up. There's only one way to go from up and you can't keep plateauing because at some point something's going to go wrong. So you might plateau for a while. So going back to allocation of funds, are you your won't own worst enemy because there's no succession planning. Succession planning isn't, oh, I'm going to hand this down to my kids. That's that's a one version of succession planning. And that's good to have. But succession planning is, hey, when this massive contract that we landed, when it's over, then what? You know, that that's when it goes down because now you're starting back from the beginning. When really, when you're on that momentum, that's when you should be building and saying, okay, after this, we got to have that pipe. You know, everyone in sales talks about the pipeline. Well, the reason the pipeline is so such a, a good analogy and so important is because there's always something coming in, but it's it funnels in so you can handle it as it comes. But if you're not filling it over here, and that's what sales, that's what marketing, that's what strategy planning, that's what business development all is, is, is creating stuff to funnel into that pipeline. What comes out of the pipeline? That's your immediate action, right? And so if you don't do that, then it takes back to our title. You're your own worst enemy. Because you're hindering your business from growing or being sustainable because you're not filling that pipeline. And I, I, I kind of hate that term because it, it's almost overused in some of the it's sales. It's a cliche world, but, thing. But yeah. It, yeah, it is. But it, it is a very good analogy of being your own, you know, your own worst enemy. So it does tie in nicely to the allocation of funds. You can, you can almost be run too tight that there's no room for error. And I'm sorry, but there's nothing out there that no business that doesn't have error. There's no business out there that doesn't run into a bad job or a less profitable job because of something that happens, even if it's out of their control. And if you're not willing to account for that, then allocation of funds isn't just not putting you know, the money in the right departments. It's also, do you have enough there? Are you profitable enough to overcome obstacles and hurdles because every little blip in business costs money? That's, that's the downside to a business is nothing's free. And, you know, that, so that's from a, from an owner's perspective uh, of small business that you can be your own worst enemy. And if you don't write your P and L's, for example, that's you're your own worst enemy because you're not tracking data. And we've talked about that before. You're not tracking information and data and you're not planning ahead. You're yeah. You're your own worst enemy. You're causing your own demise. And I, you know what, I think you're touching on something that um, not a lot of people talk about. And I, I think that there's, there's like the technical stuff. Sure. Do you got money coming in? Do you got money going out? What's the difference? Are you, 
You know what I mean? The magic formula. Are, are you making enough to continue to sustain it? But then there's the other side of it that's kind of a little bit more intangible. And I love um, getting into this kind of stuff because this is where the real, uh, the real magic happens. And outside of the technical, if you start paying attention to your mindset, the way that you think and believe in, in that, in those actions that you take. So you talk about the pipeline and it reminds me of um, this concept of scarcity versus abundance. So some people like to operate in that space of scarcity. Like there's not enough jobs out there. So you have to scramble to find one. And then when you get one, it's like, let's not lose this And all of your focus and your time and your energy goes into it. And so uh, you have nothing left over in the tank to go and get another job while this one's happening because your brain has kept you in this box. And I call that the scarcity box. It's like, there's only so many out here, but if you adjust that thinking to operate from a place of abundance, as in there's plenty of jobs, there are so many jobs that I personally can't handle all the work. So I get to pick and choose which ones I want because I'm going to enjoy that. I get to pick and choose that because I know that that one's going to be profitable for me and allow me to continue to operate, uh, to grow, to scale up. And that mindset shift, when you stop thinking that that this is the only job, we got to focus 100% on this, and you start kind of dividing that up into, oh, you know what? Well, this job is going on. Let's start looking for another job. What you essentially end up doing is filling that pipeline. And so you have a supply for that pipeline, and that supply is always coming down, and you get to control the tap now. You can turn it up. You can turn it down. And that's that that top of funnel um, or, or the beginning of your pipeline thing, that all comes from uh, inbound and outbound marketing and then inside sales and the, and the way that your inside sales team treats those inbound, you know, the leads that are coming into you from, you know, multiple, multiple sources. I saw this girl draw out a chart and I, I don't know, I'm, an, I'm like an ADD kind of guy. So I'm always like, I'm jumping from this idea to this idea. Uh, one of the things that helps me stay focused is to see things tangibly, um, <clears throat> you know, just out in the real world. And she, she took the time to draw this chart to show, okay, marketing, social media, print, uh, whatever else, radio, television. And then when she goes into social media, she branches out, well, are you doing influencer? Or are you doing, um, you know, cold leads or are you doing content-based marketing? And then out of each one of those, what what various strategies are you deploying inside of that? And just like looking at this chart, this is all the things that are like stuck up in my head um, when, when it comes to this, like when it comes to this marketing thing. And so many people think that there's just one magic bullet. Like we've touched on before, you know, spend thousands of dollars on flyers and that's going to be the way my business succeeds. Well, that's only one tiny piece of it. You know, you have to start there with this thing and and then also touch on this and touch on this and touch on this so you can create that abundance and then you can live in that space of it doesn't matter about this job. The next job's coming and I'm, I got another one after that and another one after that. I had this conversation with my brother earlier. Um, I actually, I think it was like late last year. He's doing really, really well financially. He had a couple of really stable contracts and he said, yeah, um, but a lot of this is also a politics game. So there's guys that are, you know, also in that team that don't like you because you might be doing better than them. And, you know, despite the way that I operate, I just want my flower to grow as big and as strong as it can. I'm not going to spend time cutting everybody else's flowers off so that mine looks good. I'm too busy growing mine. Right. But other people think and operate like that. They think and operate like, oh, I got to chop everybody else down so that I look okay. And and that's what you're up against in some of these um, closed communities. And so that uh, security that you think you have it is almost just a facade, right? It, there's, a, there's a falsity to it that um, unless you address, you're going to put yourself in a position to be scarce. So I, I do think a lot of, the, a lot of this is a, is a mindset thing too. For sure. And from a, from a owner's perspective, because in, in a minute, I want to touch on non-owners, more management style, but mm-hmm. from an owner's perspective, you can be your own worst enemy by arrogance and mm-hmm. thinking, oh, I can land any job I want. I don't need to go and you know cultivate the market. Well, 
get over yourself because that's just not true. No one's, no one's a fallible. No one can do that. Right. Even, even the big companies, like in the construction world, like a company like PCL, they still go and tender jobs out. They still go and bid on work. Why? Yeah. There's some that just comes to them automatically, but they can't, they're not going to rely on that. They're proactive. So that level of arrogance, um, especially with smaller to mid-level businesses that have a, a period of success, that can be a hindrance for them. The other thing is trying and spending your energy, cut, like you said, cutting other flowers down. The smear campaigns against your competition, right? And it's like you spend more time bashing your competition. That is probably one of the worst sales strategies you can poss- possibly do is bash your competition because and I've seen it in the manufacturing world. I've seen it in the trades world. I've seen it in the business finance world. They just spend all this time, but then all it does is bring a negative connotation to you as a person. It doesn't mm. build you up, right? It makes you look more powerful maybe in, in your own eyes because they're, I'm so much better than them. But from a customer perspective and a client perspective, it doesn't instill trust in what you have. All you've done is show me their flaws, but what value do you bring? You haven't taught me any value. Right? So a value-based approach to the market, to your customers, to your clients, that, that is how you succeed with, you know, with that task. So you know, just spending time bashing others, same thing. You're your own worst enemy because you'll fill your pipeline less and slower by spending all your time just bashing other people. But now from a manager's perspective, uh, so you don't own the business. Um, or, or you do, but or, or you're responsible for training your sales team, your inside sales, outside sales, whatever it is. There, there was this saying that um, that I heard all the time from, and, and I wrote a couple of them down because they were probably some of the biggest hindrances as far as customer retention and customer acquisition and customer loyalty. Mm. Um, you know, he, this mm. one individual he always loved to complain to his customers of why he wasn't able to fulfill his job and and not fulfill his job, but what? Oh, anyway, um, he, so something would go wrong, which happens, right? Uh, A product didn't come in on time or, you know, customer misheard something, which that happens all the time. It's like, you said it'd be here Tuesday. No, I said, it'd be here around Tuesday. You know, you said it'd be here Next week, yeah, it's Monday. Like, there's a few days. <laughs> oh, right. So, I mean, those things too. But, but the responses were like, yeah, you know, we had uh, uh, the truck that came in, it broke down, and they had to they had to bring in another truck, and this just long story. And I was like, you don't have to tell them all that information. For one, they don't care. They just care about the results. And two, all you're doing is creating excuses. If you want customer acquisition, you want customer loyalty. Yes, transparency is important, but you don't need to give away how you run your business. If you keep that to yourself, how your business is ran, and you just produce the results or you fix the problems that come in front of them and you overcome those hurdles, they really don't care that you only had two people working that day or that you had to bring in someone extra for that day. Customers don't care. But if you just bombard them with that information and be like, yeah, so that's why this didn't work. It's like, then what am I paying for? Right? What value? I might as well just buy this product direct. Why am I going through you? A good example I would use to like to like illustrate this, like metaphorically, is like when you get into a car, do I have to explain to you that when you push the gas pedal, it pulls a cord and then it opens up this thing? You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden there's more spark and there's more fuel and then the air and exhaust and then pistons. No. Hold the wheel, put your foot on the gas pedal and go. That's what, that's what some, but like I have a problem and I need to go somewhere. That's the solution. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to put our foot on the gas pedal. We're going to hold the steering wheel. We're going to get you there. And that's it. Yeah. They don't need all that other nonsense. No, there's, there's a time for explanations, but, but explanations should never be excuses. Right. One of the other things that, that came up, it was always said, you know, something got missed, which happens. Same thing. You're busy. Things get missed. That's, that's a reality. But you know, something gets missed and you phone the customer or they phone you even worse asking where their order is or where this product is. And you're like, oh yeah, it's just been so busy. Like it must've just fallen through the cracks. We didn't even order it. What does that tell the customer? You could have said, look, I'm sorry. It got missed. 
I will do whatever I can to make this still happen for you. That is a reality. That's a transparency. That's an admission of error. And you're more likely to retain that customer. But to say, look, I'm just so busy. It fell through the cracks. Like kind of take it. To All do that, that time and energy that you spend oh, on creating these excuses, man. You, and it, you it, it was so much more basis. productive. Yeah. Daily basis. And, and what that tells the customer is there's other customers that are more important than you. So mm-hmm. yours got put to the side and we just never got to it. That's wrong. That's wrong. And, and that is being not only your own worst enemy, because that's your reputation on the line, but as a business owner, allowing somebody to operate like that, that's a hindrance to you as well. When it, that happened all the time. And there was this, there was this saying, this catchphrase that became prevalent, not only along, not only within the business itself, but it became prevalent with customers. And it was this catchphrase that he would say, and I'm not going to say it because it'll definitely, give away too much. <laughs> it, it will give away too much, but it, it became a joke. And that's he as a person in his role became a joke because he would just say that, but it was along the lines of, yeah, it's, it's just been so busy, right? Like can't keep up, can't keep up. So busy. What's well, like, that's dude, insane. You, you, you leave. Uh, five minutes before your slot, you're in a management position. Don't you can't look at a clock anymore. And on top of that, that's your job. Your responsibility is to catch those things. You you're not you're not the rookie anymore. Like take accountability, take some responsibility. If if somebody is buying a product for you or a service from you, they are paying a premium for professionalism, mm. for accuracy, for information. It doesn't mean the job has to be a hundred percent. It just has to be acceptable to the client where they walk away happy. That is customer retention. And that's how you get customer acquisition is by having that reputation, but sliding by you go into a restaurant. What is more irritating when you sit down at a restaurant and you order a nice meal and your foods takes like a half hour to get, you can, you can deal with that as a client. Mm -hmm. You can accept that. You can see around. Yeah. It's super full. Maybe I got missed. Maybe I got whatever. But when the server comes and says, yeah, it's just so busy in here. Well, that's I'm annoying. Sorry. Hire somebody else. Where's the other cook? Bring somebody up. Yeah. I'm sorry that I'm a bird <laughs> for bringing my business here as well. Stop saying that to people. Stop saying it in the food industry. Stop saying it in the service industry. Stop saying it in the construction industry because it's not an excuse. It actually Check. demeans you. It's your, your own worst enemy by saying that. Yeah. So check this out. I can't remember where I read this or heard this, uh, but it doesn't matter. I, I learned somewhere never to lead with an apology. That doesn't mean ignore the apology. You definitely got to apologize and own your shit, but never lead with an apology. Instead, lead with gratitude. And this has changed my business tremendously. So if I screw something up, Let's say I missed a deadline or I was a little late on something or whatever, you know, there's a million gears going at any given time in any business. And it's really easy for just one to stop working properly. You got to get in there. You got to grease it, make it happen. So uh, I'm late on a deadline. Listen, uh, Mitch, I really appreciate your patience right now. We're dealing with a bit of an overload. I apologize that this is taking a little bit longer, but I have got the right guy to do the right thing and take care of business. Here's our new deadline. I hope that that's acceptable to you. Uh, is there any way that we can, you know, uh, work together to make sure that that satisfies? It's so simple. I'm grateful for your time. I'm grateful for your consideration. I'm grateful for your patience because that's what you have to be. Now, here's the thing is psychologically, it almost uh, triggers you to go, oh, he cares about me. Mm-hmm. And that changes our relationship from one businessman to another businessman is, is that I care about you. I just showed you that I care about you. And now we can get to the solution here. And that's it. Once it's over, you're like, wow, he appreciates me and he solved that problem. You know, he must be working really, really hard. I can't, I am, I know what it's like because I run a business and you know, it's tough or whatever the situation may be. So leading with that gratitude before you you bring in that apology and the solution is, is such a magical formula. Uh, it, it changes the game up. I, I was thinking though, some people don't even know that they're in their own way. 
Some people don't even know that this, these habits that they've formed and, you know, they're come up to the p- position that they're in. Cause that's a little lot. If some dude started out banging a hammer and, you know, eventually he became a framer and now he's a manager. Then he became a general contractor because he knows the business, you know, inside and out, maybe he's got some connections or whatever, but he like, he doesn't have any um, interpersonal skills. I think the first thing that I would argue is, um, you need to be radically self-aware in the position that you're in. You need like radically like that, that thing that you say that has become a joke among your peers. Like, why is that funny? You know what I'm saying? Like you should be a hero in your position and instead you're a laughing stock, and that's kind of scary. Do you even know that that's happening? So uh, how would you um, navigate helping someone figure that out uh so like from my like me coming to business and helping that it it takes observation and and to say and it's something i meant to say earlier was going to say and and it actually applies now is be the person you want your client to be right so if you want a client to be understanding appreciative not annoying right? You want your clients to phone you every so often, but just checking in, but not demanding, then don't be that person to them, right? Mm -hmm. Don't be that person that doesn't care because if your clients don't care, that's a toxic relationship, right? So be that person. So if you're a person that's always making excuses, then how about you think about a client that's always making excuses for late payment or a client that holds back money because of excuses? Don't be that person then when it comes to other things, right? You want a client to be super transparent with you of why they can't pay their bill because their kid broke their leg or because they were what, for whatever reason, then, then don't be that person. Or you want your clients to be compassionate with you, then be compassionate with your clients. It's a two-way street. And I think a little bit of observation, and we've talked about people just not being coachable because they're, they're once again, own worst enemy, that level of arrogance that they can't be taught. But for somebody that's wanting to learn, wanting to grow, it's true. They may not know that they do these things because in their mind, it's justified in their mind. This makes sense. We're short staffed. It's not going to work. I need my clients to know that what they don't understand is how that's projecting to their clients, mm. right? Their clients, they may care about you. They may like your business, appreciate your effort, but they don't care that someone called in sick because by you saying, Hey, we're short staffed today. I can't, I can't take this phone call. I can't deal with you. I can't service you to what you, you know we say that we can because we're short staffed. Okay. So that one or two people that didn't show up, they run the boat. What are you doing? Right. That's the message you're sending a lack of confidence in your abilities because you know, your inside salesperson didn't show up because they were sick. So now you're penal, you know, you're in your, in your client's eyes, you're penalizing them because they legit were sick. We're not talking about someone that's flaky. We're talking about somebody that is home with a migraine or their kids are in the hospital for whatever reason. Don't put, put this on them. This is your accountability. And I think for somebody to just realize how that sounds, you know, a lot of the people would adjust that interaction with that customer. Something else that, that I noticed the other day. So I was out of town, I was, I was traveling and there was, I was at a gas station and I have a lot of compassion because I worked at a gas station. So I, I try very hard to be super nice to those people. It's my first um, job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the, this guy was filling up. I didn't really make the connection of who he was and what he was driving. But there was this um, guy that came in. He bought a, a corn dog. And about three or four minutes later, comes in just ripping them a new one about his corn dog being overcooked or undercooked or whatever. I'm like, it's a corn dog. I don't care. How do you tell? But <laughs> <laughs> so then he gets in his truck, his big, uh, big hauling truck. And he drives away and I caught up to him on the highway and I started reading what the truck was because it was a big, big company truck. It was a, uh, a meal prep, like those food boxes where it's like whole foods and, and uh, you know, keto friendly and homegrown and blah, blah. And I'm like, wait a sec. This guy was just screaming at somebody about a corn dog. <laughs> so not only, not only is he, going completely against the big billboard that he drives down the road by his choices in food, but his reputation, how he treated other people. I took a note of that business. 
because it's like, yeah, maybe the owner cares, but he didn't invest in all his employees to make sure they care, to make sure that when they're driving, I mean, this should extend beyond that, but especially when you're driving a company vehicle with a logo on it, or you have that shirt with that logo or whatever, whatever role you're representing that company or your business in, there should be never a potential client that walks away because of a bad interaction. And, and that is being your own worst enemy, not caring about, yeah, oh, it's just a truck driver. It's not just a truck driver. You know what truck drivers are in the supply industry? They are your face. Everywhere. Everywhere. You go to a job site in the construction world and the delivery guy comes up. You know how important it is that there is a good reputation and a good rapport with that driver? Because I've seen it both. I've, I've had it both where the driver just drives the customers nuts and they complain to me all the time. And then I've had guys in the delivery truck that are just awesome people, right? And the, the customers love them and they bring good information to them and they're courteous and they just, they bring that element. That's a guy you want on your team, right? Because being your own worst enemy is not really filtering or mentoring all the people in your company. And if you're too big to do that, then you have to do those check-ins. You know that show Undercover Boss? Whatever your opinion is of it, the fact is they get so big that they're out of touch with what's going on. Now, with some of it embellished, of course, it's reality television. But it gives a really good um, insight onto when you lose touch of your business, you your own worst enemy because a lot of those guys are like, I see business walking out the door unnecessarily. Right. right? It's not because we're short staff. It's not because of all these external reasons. It's because we're, I'm out of touch and the people don't care anymore. And my customer or my employees are not servicing the customers to the standards that I would hope they do. So once well, again, I, you're your own worst enemy. Yeah. Uh, and I think of it in terms of, you know, like the bigger, the bigger businesses, they all have their, vision mission statement you know the all all these i remember working at walmart first summer uh when i was in high school and they did this like raw raw thing like every beginning of every shift you go in and there was like clapping and just all this nonsense and i'm like i'm just pushing carts like i don't understand what's happening here looking back on that something really stands out to me and that's I start a thing because I'm a hundred percent about it, right? Whatever the thing is, I really like marketing. I like marketing because um, I find people fascinating. I'm creative in nature. So I love to, you know, do movies, videos, music, uh, graphic design, all that stuff. And it all does different things to our brains. And I'm super passionate about it. Like I'm geeking out right now, just explaining it to you guys. And some people listening are just like, wow, that's crazy. (laughs) But I'm 100% on it. Now, if I hire somebody, let's say, to do something, you know, there's a role that I need to fill. Maybe, you know, post description copywriting or something. It doesn't sound very fancy, does it? But that person has to be really passionate about writing tiny little stories. And if they're not, here's what happens. Because it's not their company. They don't give a shit. So I'm lucky if I get that person and they're passionate about something, like writing little tiny stories to put in post description copies, they're going to be at like an 80% maximum. You know what I'm saying? Because that other 20% is like a little bit of resentment because they're doing something for me and not for themselves. And that's, you know, that's their own issue. But 80%. Okay. Get that. So they, so I got people out here, 80 percenting representing my business. So unless I do something really, really intentional to install in them a mission and a purpose and a value in what they're doing, my business is not going to be operating at peak performance. And this can go all the way from, okay, so listen, uh, um, we do a lot of video work, so I need somebody to edit videos Now, uh, me personally, I'm not a fan of editing videos. It was fun and interesting when I was doing like music videos and stuff like that, just like learning it. But now it's become really repetitive and the ADHD thing. And uh, I'm just like, I'm done with this. I need some new stimulation. So that's not exactly my passion. But what if there was somebody out there whose passion it was to edit videos? I want that person on my team because now they're going to serve that passion. They're going to serve that purpose. They're not doing it for the paycheck. 
25, 30 dollars an hour. That's a lot of money for somebody, you know, who, who uh, comparatively is coming out of a minimum wage position after coming out of college or something and their passion is to do this thing. So 20 or 30 bucks an hour is, is a good paycheck, but it's not enough to motivate them to do a really, really good job. So you as the, as the business owner need to be in check with that, in tune with that. Anybody you get is at 80% and anything you can do to keep them at 80% is valuable. Whatever that is, whether it's team building, ongoing, continuing education, helping them elevate themselves, turning them into bosses, turning them into entrepreneurs. You know what? My, my girlfriend, is, she is uh, super, super intelligent. But one thing that she's come to terms with for herself is that I don't want to be a number one anywhere. I, I, I love being a number two, though. And I, there's a million reasons why I could speculate why that is, what, this, that, and whatever. And every once in a while, we kind of dig into that when we're having like our deep spiritual talks or whatever. But she's completely happy and comfortable fulfilling that role. It gives her meaning. It gives her purpose. And she, she wants that for herself. So you got to find people that know that about themselves. And so this kind of points back at there's a there's a deeper level of radical self-awareness. You need to just completely and fully break down all those walls, all that ego thing that's like you trying to confirm to yourself that you belong here or whatever it is and and really get deep into it and identify those insecurities and and work to deconstruct them so they're not affecting the way that you're doing business and and how you um how you show up in the world and when you break those barriers down this other thing comes out and i think it comes back to what you said uh, about halfway through all this uh, if you want to deal with compassionate people, you want to deal with understanding people who are patient with you, even though sometimes it's really hard, then you have to be that person, right? And I think of it in terms of kind of leading the energy. So if your energy is always like stiff and, and you're always like the grumpy guy, you know, and you're just angry about everything and everything is like from here to here, that's not productive, the message that sends to the people that you're working with is that you don't care about them. You only care about the outcome. And when pe- when you don't care about the people that are helping you achieve that outcome, they stop caring. And so that ego, that thing that I'm the boss, do what I say, ruling with an iron fist thing. And man, it's, I like to think that because I've evolved, so has the rest of the world. But dude, everywhere I go, I see this. I can tell immediately when I walk into you know a bar or a restaurant or something like that, I can tell what kind of management is in place. You can see it in the way that people are out there interacting with the customers. They don't care. They're rude. They're short. um, They're, they're impersonal. Like that smile, customer service voice, such a load of bullshit. I hate it. And so does every other customer because we know how fake it is. But every once in a while you'll show up at a place and um, there's, there's actually a place that I frequent here in Calgary Uh, dude's name is Justin. Um, I think the bar's Klein Harris and and I'm, I'm intentionally putting this in here because I I implore anybody to go to this place. The dude is so hundred percent genuine. He makes it a point. Sometimes when they're really, really busy and understaffed, it it takes a minute for me to get my water or my drink or whatever it is that I'm getting. But the dude stops and takes like 30 seconds to just be human with you. He'll explain my drink or what I ordered or whatever. He'll, he brings in stories and all this really cool shit. And it's just such a good and refreshing experience to deal with that person in that way versus, um, you know, any other number of bars that you go to where the server's just like trying to quickly get your drink, quick, quickly get your food, quickly get you out the door. We've become so attached to this idea of speed and convenience that we forgot the humanity behind it. You remember I said, <laughs> when was the last time you actually spoke to somebody at a window at like Tim Hortons or McDonald's or something? Like, I don't get words anymore from human beings. It's like, pfft, I'm at a window, something on a stick just got handed out the window to me. I got to like tap a card and then I'm next window. It's, and that's it's, also it's, us as consumers, right? We're, we're at fault of that as well. Mm. Um, and I think with world conditions lately, it hasn't helped that personal touch because everyone's so scared of each other and scared of communicating, oh, yeah. right? So a but weird I'm thing not, for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm not here to you know, politically debate all those decisions, but you have to be aware of it. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, one of the other things that, um, that was kind of in my notes for, for this section was, you know, it's true. You want to be the person that you want your clients to be because that attracts certain people, right? You're nobody's for everybody. Mm -hmm. There's people that don't like me and that's okay. Um, but I try to be as genuine as I can, but as, especially in the trades world, but this kind of goes into anything, uh, whatever your skill is that you started that, that company, that business with, you're good at it, or you think you are, and that's okay. That's good. You know, you want some pride in your work, but the day that you think you're so good that you start degrading or diminishing the value of your client's input. That's wrong. That's a turning point. And you, you have to stop that out. And from a, a business coach and development perspective, that's something that I take very seriously. Um, I've seen guys that they just complain about their customers. You know, all they do is there's a million colors and then they pick the four colors that are the worst for them. And, blah, and it's like, yeah, but they have to live with that decision just because it's not something you would do at your house doesn't make it wrong. Right. And he's like, oh, I should just, I just tell them what to do. And, and, you know, it's going to look good when it's done. Maybe, but is it what they're going to love? And you've taken away that choice from them. So my solution to it was give them groups of, of options that work for you and your style and your, how you manage things, but still give them the choice and then say, and if you want to go outside this realm, there's these options, but they come at a premium. Right. So you have to just be acknowledging of that there is an added cost to that and let them decide. And if they want to go outside of that realm of that entry level price, this is where systems and system selling is just so valuable. But if you're so arrogant that you don't create systems and options for your clients, and this is not just in trades, this is in any business, then you're not servicing your customers to the best of your ability because you're allowing your arrogance of how you do the job to belittle them. And now all of a sudden you're belittling your clients and you're viewing them just as a price tag and, and a revenue stream. That's you might not even through. know you're doing that either. No, I know. But, and that's right? like, you think it. you're trying to help that person by like making those additional suggestions or say, no, 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 your idea, you know, is to this or to that or whatever. Like you're probably being super polite about it. And you probably do care about that person having to live in that, you know, nasty Pepto-Bismol pink bathroom for the rest of their lives but maybe they like that. You know what I'm saying? I, I, it's, it's not for me. If I had it my way, every house would be white, gray, black, and you know, maybe a hint of color somewhere, <laughs> yeah. but that's me. And I, I, you know, you can't project your own shit out into the world like that and expect to um, build relationships. I come from a perspective that just because I, I know something really, really well, doesn't mean I'm done. Yeah. There's more. I, I can learn more. I can do more. I can evolve more. And, and it's the sec, it's like, here's what you know. Here's what you know you don't know. But here's what you don't know you don't know. And that's terrifying to me because, you know, all my life I've been trying to get a grasp on the way the world works. And there's so much stuff that I don't know I don't know. And so unless I'm like constantly in that um, open-minded perspective of just trying to learn and grow here, here's what's crazy about it. Let's just say on the color scheme, the color palette thing, you know, these three colors go together, but if you add in that Pepto-Bismol pink it's done, right? Right. What if you do that? And it actually turns out to be like fire. Like that, that is an awesome thing that just happened by accident against your will. You just opened up the door to something. Now you can take that thing with you into the next place. And, and if somebody's like, listen, I've got these three things and I think it's going to be like this. And you're like, you know, I did this thing and I didn't think it was going to work out. <laughs> but here we are. You know, I have this new information. Unless you come from that perspective, though, you're closing a lot of doors. If you think clients are always dumb, mm. or customers are dumb. Um, we live in the, the information age. That's what it's labeled. Customers are more educated now than ever before. Yeah, exactly. Most customers, like when I, when I was in the supply industry, they'd come. Now, the problem with the internet is, you know, that not everything on the internet is real. But 
at the same time, they've come and they've done the research and they're coming to you proud of all the research. Now, maybe you have to make some tweaks. Maybe you have to educate them on a few things that are more applicable, but don't, don't just write it off that just because they haven't worked where you work for however long you've been there, that they know nothing because that will stifle your growth. And you also can't, it also keeps you a little bit more honest because anything you say can and will be held against you on the internet. And so they, they can look it up and they can verify that. And if it doesn't agree with what, uh, you know, I had my ticket in uh, spray foam in SPF and the amount of, I don't want to say garbage, but the amount of bad information on the internet um, is, is crazy. It, there's so much, but the problem is, is that the information there isn't wrong. It's just not applicable because there's different regulations and rules on product and application in different parts of the world. So in the States, Context. there's very little regulation. And so, yeah, they have lots of fires. They have lots of these horror stories where people's lives have been ruined because of, of different things. And then, so in Canada, it's like, people are like, oh, they burned down buildings. It's like, well, not in Canada because we have different regulations. There's things to prevent that, but there's not in the States, but all the stories are in the States. Oh, someone you know had to move out of their house because of this. I'm like, where was that? Because in the UK and Canada, it's completely different regulations. And, and that's just spray foam. That's not anything else we're talking about. Even finances are different in the States than in Canada based on banking regulations and you know all of that. So don't feel that your customers are ever dumb or below you. They, they Maybe they're misinformed, but they're informed. And, and that is something you cannot overlook. You have to accept that and acknowledge it. Look, watch. This is how simple it is. Okay? Let's say I went to you and I wanted to get my deck built right mm -hmm. so i asked you a bunch of questions you told me some things i'm like okay cool let me think about that here's what happens okay google how much does it cost to build a deck a deck <laughs> okay normally it reads it to me out loud the first thing that comes up you're looking at around 40 to 84 dollars per square foot with the material installation and custom structured base now i can continue to do this search but that's how fast this happens so I know that if I want the cheapest material possible, right, the fastest, easiest labor, I can get it for about 40 bucks a square foot. I know that if I want the best stuff, like full cedar, mahogany, wood, I don't know woods, but you bring in some good woods, <laughs> $84 a square foot, right? This is this, and I have access to this, and it's just one quick little tiny article. This is how fast people can learn things about your business. And so transparency is prudent. Yeah. Being honest and upfront, lying and, 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 and trying to sugarcoat things or dress things up to make it look like one thing or not another, like you're doing yourself a disservice. You're your own worst enemy. Let's bring it you're back your to own worst titles. enemy. You're in your own way. And if you didn't know that somebody could do that, like I, I just showed you, it's that easy. I can say, okay, Google to my phone and it's going to wonder what I want to learn. And then I'm going to ask it some things and it's going to tell me some information. But a smart salesman or business owner or whatever person interacts with that sale recognizes that. And then, but then asks questions. It doesn't fight it. It doesn't say, oh, Google's stupid or yeah, anyone can do it for that price. It doesn't bash anyone around you. You ask questions. Question there. What materials was that um, comprised of? Mm -hmm. Right. Is that current market lumber? Look what lumber just did. Right. right. And incredibly change. It's going to change the building industry because it's unaffordable or you look at it and say, okay, is that an American dollars? Is that Canadian dollars? Right. All these little factors that say, okay, so give me all the context because that's one thing about the internet, right? It doesn't give context all the time. So give me the context. Let me do some comparisons because yes, my price is higher than that. Let's figure out why. Oh, okay. So here's, here's what I found. Now, is this your budget? The, the Google price? Is that what you budgeted? Yes. Okay. In order to do it for that price, this is what has to happen. Are you okay with that? Well, right. now all of a sudden you're not, you can stick to your guns. You don't have to match that price for what you offered, but now you've, you've given them the dignity to make the decision because you've added to their information. You've added to their education. You've brought value and you haven't even talked about closing a sale yet. And they already trust you. Whereas the guy down the street, he's just going to be like, yeah, I'll do it for that. Yeah. Okay. But then their deck falls apart in two years. Or a guy will be like, that's unrealistic. This is your price. Take it or leave it. Well, they're not going to go with him either because bullying doesn't work in business. Right.
So be You're the wondering guy. why you can't get more customers. Exactly. So be the guy or, or woman or, or you know whoever you are, be that person that adds to your customer's base, adds to their knowledge, brings value because the deal will close itself and probably with higher revenue and profit margin than if you force them with a decision. And, you know, I always go back to roofing, but roofing was the same thing. They, the roofing world, they introduced a product um, that the market needed. It needed a very low cost uh, shingle to get out there. And so they created this level of, of acceptance now of a poor quality shingle when really the actual shingles that should have been in the market were a step up, but they created this economic line. But people just became so used to that, that that's what they wanted. Well, now to get people back to buying a proper roofing shingle is really hard because right, they, right. they tank the market, but, it's, but people are doing it and they're buying into it and they're upgrading those shingles or whatever that product is. But the reason is education. People had to say, look, Here's why shingles through the 90s and early 2000s were terrible. And everyone hates the shingle industry because they all had to redo their roof. It's not because the shingle, having a shingle on your roof is bad. It's what shingles were chosen and why. Why do homes need new products after being 10 years built? Because builders chose poor products. Let's be real. We can yeah, start yeah. listing them off. But homeowners now are so educated and people buying, they look into these things and they can actually demand higher quality products now, whereas they couldn't before. So, you know, look at the hailstorm that hit Calgary. I mean, world news, two years, they're still fixing damage. But look at the amount of damage that was done due to poor, poor products. Yeah, it okay, looked well, like it, a war zone here, man. It, it was did. It, was, it, was, it blew my mind when I drove by, you know, that area of the city. But could that have been avoided? See, now when people see that, they're going to be like, how does that not happen to me? How can I make yeah. sure that I avoid that? So they're going to do the research. They're going to find products that would have been resistant to that. And now they're going to start demanding them. Now, as a builder, if you turn around and say, no, that's just too expensive. That's not your call. Right. Right. And they're just going to go find someone that agrees with them because they have documentation and proof that it's going to solve their needs. So don't be too arrogant for your customers. And in trades, they're just really guilty of that. It's kind of just, it's really geared towards that where customers are dumb because they haven't done this for 30 years. There's a culture but there that's there like, is. you're against each other. Yeah. You're against the customer. And I never wrapped my mind around this because the perspective that I come from is we're on the same team here. We're against the problem. Mm -hmm. What's that problem? Okay. So you and me are going to work together to figure out how we can defeat that problem. And that's, I don't know, that's just how I've always looked at it. I immediately assume that you and me are on the same team. So you got a problem. You don't have enough inbound leads or you don't have a, a full enough pipeline. Okay, cool. That's a horrible problem to have. I know what that does to businesses. It's happened to my business. It's happened to millions of other businesses and it's a tragedy. So let's work together to defeat that. What kind of a budget do you have? Do you have $10 a day? Do you have 10,000 a day? Where are you at? Because any number one of these solutions will will achieve some kind of measurable result. But what's your expectation now? Okay, you want a million new clients? You're going to need a budget to support that. Okay, you don't have a budget to support a million new clients. Well, let's look at what you have then and then what I can achieve with that and see you know, if this is something. Do you have six months to do this? But do you're you not turning around and being like, this? that customer's dumb because he <clears throat> wants a million followers with $10 a day. It's not about them being dumb. They just, right? uh, they don't have realistic expectations. They don't know never because been shown. they have, they don't have context. I yeah. have context. And that's like you in your business, you have context. Anybody else that's listening, that's running their own business, you have the context. They don't. So it's your job to help them get there mm -hmm. against your common enemy. The common enemy being the problem that you're helping them solve. And when you start coming from that perspective, you're going to immediately see a way faster and way easier close rate way higher close rate. You're going to see customers want to return to you. You're going to see customers sharing that experience with somebody else because of how amazing it was that you treated them differently than anybody else that's in the business because everybody else in the business is treating them like they're an idiot. Yeah. I, I worked with real estate agents for a really, really long time. And I had the opportunity to sit in accidentally on a lot of those meetings where they were just listing and 
some of these real estate agents were almost condescending with the level of contempt that they had because they had this big giant ego that they just closed two million dollar sales this year and made a hundred grand and they're all high on themselves driving around in their Lamborghini or their Jaguar or whatever it is thinking that they're you know king shit and you can tell the energy of the of the homeowner is just kind of slowly sinking and sinking and sinking and I've seen guys that work with people they're selling two hundred thousand dollar condos and they, they, your commission on that's like five grand. It's nothing. It's pennies in a bucket co- in comparison to the other stuff that's out there. But they do hundreds of these deals a month because they're they're down to earth. They're connected to the people that they're serving. They're in tune with that. And, and that resonates with the people that they're serving. And so I think that awareness, just keying into that now, after listening to this podcast, if you're out there uh, trying to see this in practical application, just go out there and start paying attention to the way that you're like, even your own personal initial reaction to a client and the way that they, when they have a special request, if there's a special request or there's something going on and your immediate reaction is to push back against it, examine why, why is that your immediate, is that even yours? Or is that like installed in you from somebody before you, you know, a generation ago or, or whatever the case may be, because times are, they're always changing. They're always evolving. And I think culture plays a lot into that, but that, uh, that mindset of being on the team of the people that you're serving will definitely help change that big time. I think the, the last two points that I had on, on this were, um, you know, that saying that, Oh, if you're a business owner, um, you have the freedom of, for your own hours. It's true, but let's put that in context, right? Having the flexibility of setting your own hours doesn't mean you don't have to put in 10 hours a day. It doesn't mean that you don't work seven days a week you know, should you do that for the rest of your life? No, you know, uh, maybe you only have to do four days a week, whatever that is. But just because you don't have to show up eight to five doesn't mean you don't have to put in the work and the time setting your own hours. All it means is you're only accountable to yourself. That's all it means. It doesn't mean the results are still going to come. If you only work one hour a day, if you work one hour a day, you're going to get one hour a day results. So (laughs) if you want to scale up your business, understand what am I willing to do? Does it mean I have to work a few extra hours? Am I willing to do that? Or should I be content with where I'm at? So being your own worst enemy, sometimes is just not even putting in the effort and, and thinking, well, I'm a business owner. Why wouldn't it work automatically? Because the time I has only to have to work in. four hours. Yeah. I only work four hours. You know, you look at these guys and they're like, I only work two hours a day. Okay. Well, what did you do when you started? Oh, I was like 24 hours a day. Okay. That's context, right? Yeah. It's a bit of a grind when you start. So that's the one thing that I just, I wanted to put when it came to time into your business, it's a reality that you have to understand and, and put in context. Um, and, and the last thing kind of touching back on, on the arrogance, um, of, you know, working with your customers. So you're not above learning. You're not above educating, right? No, nobody is. So if you think that no one can do what you do as good as you do it, you're holding yourself, you're holding your business back on a few different fronts. First of all, if you think that no one can do what you do as good as you do it, you will lose work. It's naive. Because there are other tradespeople, finance people, service industry people, business owners that are just as good as you. Maybe they don't live next door, but they're just as good. And there are some that are better. I, it's, it doesn't matter where you are. There's always somebody better. There's always someone worse. There's always someone better. Yeah. And I don't care who you are. Right. And then in that same breath, one of those companies I was talking about was getting angry because he didn't have the time to go basically do his own sales because his crew wasn't as good as him as doing their jobs as he was. So, okay. So now you've hired people that will never be as good as you in what you do, not in your eyes anyway. So that means you always have to be there to micromanage them. Mm. But then you're mad that now I have to take time away from that to go deal with clients and they're idiots. And so, you know, you're taking time out of there and you're angry because the clients don't know as much as you know, and they're not as good at design as, as you are. They don't understand their finance as good as you do. But then in the meantime, you're mad that you've had to leave your crew or your team 
because they're obviously failing without you there. That mentality is not sustainable. It's not how you keep employees or clients and you, you're going to burn yourself out and you're never going to grow your business because you have, if you don't trust the people you hire then you hired the wrong people. So if you don't want to hire a salesperson because nobody can do sales with this as good as you can, then trust the people on doing the tasks, doing the work. And if you can't let one of those go, then never complain that you're not growing. You're not retaining people. You can't find good help because you are your own worst enemy when it comes to that. Proper businesses delegate to the right people. They've hired the right people and they trust them to do their job. It's plain and simple. And if you're not willing to do that, then you will never scale your business ever. Yeah. You get, you get stuck in that, uh, that trap of building yourself a job. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's a perfect place to leave this. Uh, if you're watching, listening, wherever you're at, like, follow, subscribe, drop a comment, uh, email us, let us know what you think about what we're sharing in this. And if you want to hear us talk about a specific subject, let us know that too, um, because we want to make sure that what we're bringing you as far as uh, the value in this podcast is actually something that is serving you uh, in a way that's elevating you and your business. Um, But for now, That's a wrap on this episode and we will see you in the next one.